Welcome everyone, good evening to this uh, special edition meetup uh, of the PHP Mexico community. It's myself, Mariano Renteria, and I also have Sagrario on the floor with me on this awesome night. How are you, Sagrario? Hey, good evening, everybody. I'm good. Thanks, Mariano. It's glad to be here. <laughs> Perfect. Well, um, I am going to begin by presenting the team who is going to be with us or just introducing us ourselves. Uh, well, Sagrario, if you guys don't know her, Sagrario Meneses, she's a software engineer. She has 10 years of experience working in tech. She's currently a senior software engineer at Wiseline, and she is also part of the core team at PHP Mexico. She is part of the Women Who Code community. Also, one of her interests, of course, it's PHP, Symfony, technical design driven, architecture, and Golang. You know, that's that's kind of weird, but you know, we'll we'll let her do that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, and for those who don't know Mariano, he's software developer, director of engineering at my trainer, podcaster of Chile Mole Tech. He has written a guide for technical leaders, and he's also part of PHP Core, PHP MX Core team. You can see on these slides some of his interests, and you can follow him and on Twitter as at Mariano Renteria. <laughs> okay. Um... And it seems like we may be having issues with our Spanish stream. Uh, you know, we are working on that at the moment. In the meantime, I want to present the backstage. Uh, we have Tamara. She's a software engineer, plant lady, cat lady, return early, return often is her motto. Uh, we also have Manuel Ojeda. He's a PHP developer, Vue advocate, and coffee lover. Um, we also have Luis Sanchez, you know, he's a community expert in Mexico, also in Latin America. He is part of the of the Mozilla team as well. Uh, we also have Lady, she's Venezuelan software engineer and web developer, and Marco, a software engineer on Kotlin, Java, PHP, Flutter, C Sharp, JavaScript. She, he's a community collaborator, a hobbyist of gaming, gaming developer, and flag football and electric bass. So, so many things on his side. Thanks to the backstage. And yeah, today our sponsor is Etsy. Etsy is a global marketplace where people make, sell, buy, and collect unique items. They have just started an engineering team in Mexico, and in the next hour, they plan to open our eyes to help us see what's coming. Perfect. Well, uh, you know, again, this event will not be possible without the sponsorship of Etsy, you know, who, who help us to get this uh, happen. But also our community has individual contributors, which we like to continuously endorse. And I want to just give a high five and a round of applause for Juan Flores, Fidel Aquino, Luis Cortez, David Leon, David Flores and David Valdez, who are always supporting this community. Some of them are also Patreon sponsors. You know, we have a Patreon account. Everyone is welcome to chime in, you know, um, help us with that money. We pay our services, we buy swag to give away. And over there, we have Jujo, the mouse, Richard, Eric, David De Leon as well, and Sagrario, who is my co host here. Yes, thank you so much for your support. And if you, if you want to join us, please use the QR code if you want to support or yeah. and yeah uh, we have this slide about the php mx history mariano you want to start yep yep i mean just fyi the php community was born php mexico community was born in 2010 with a group of mexican developers you know from mexico city and puebla they they group together and also they they form what was called php the right way uh, an initiative to bring current topics and monthly talks at Mexico City, you know, and that's kind of our meetup group name. Um, now, in 2016, we got Rasmus to give a face-to-face -face meetup in Mexico City uh, when he spoke about PHP 7, uh, you know, and we are going to be talking about the modern of PHP now with him uh, four out, uh, five years after. And in 2020, we begin doing our virtual meetups. Uh, we also started opening a space only for women to start listening to their voices and include them 
And we have been doing over 44 meetups virtual, virtually since 2020. So that has been, has been an adventure. Yeah, and if you aren't yet part of PHP MX community, but you want to be, join our Slack workspace. Uh, here you can see some of our active channels. General Channel has more than 1,100 members. <laughs> so yeah, we are a big community. And I would like to special mention the Women Power Channel. Uh, it is a channel that we could call new because it was born alongside PHP MX Women last year, as Marlena mentioned as a safe space for all the members of the community who identify as a woman. Perfect. Well, we are always looking for speakers in our community, you know, as, as you guys heard, and girls, uh, we are doing uh, meetups constantly. So if you want to uh, participate here, just email us at meetup at phpmexico.mx with a subject charla php mexico. Uh, you can also DM us on Twitter at php mexico. That's how you can find us or just Put, leave a message on our Meetup Slack channel. And yeah, this is a really exciting moment. <laughs> I've worked with PHP for about eight years, and today I have the opportunity to share the screen with the creator, founder of that programming language, then Rasmus Ledorf. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. I mean, well, I, I, I asked Rasmus, you know, like I, I, I wanted him to tell me some something that nobody knew about him or very few knew and you know he told me he was uh, an electronics enthusiast and uh, what he likes to do with with his uh with his kid and that he's also a danish person born in greenland right rasmus born in greenland yes <laughs> perfect thanks and rasmus well, he, oh sorry <laughs> i was about to say that you also are a distinguished engineer at etsy and yeah that's true yes <laughs> Distinguished just means old in this case. But yes. <laughs> old and respected. Uh, I mean, it comes with it, it comes with the package. Yeah. Well, um, uh, Sagrari, I think that will be it, right? This is where we left the floor. Leave the floor for Rasmus. Okay. Thank you very much for arranging this and setting things up. Um, I've got my PHP Mexico shirt on, my flag in the background. As long as my graphics card can handle it, we'll see. Um, the slides are online, talks.php.net, where I always put my slides, etsymex21. Uh, my Twitter is at Rasmus. So at Etsy, we do a lot of PHP. The entire site is, in, is written in PHP, um, but we do have many other technologies on various backend services. So we're not just a PHP shop. There's a ton of PHP, but there are some teams that barely touch PHP at all actually so we're not completely a php shop uh, any large company will have a ton of different technologies a web serving stack is very sort of old school lamp linux apache mysql and php um, with some other technologies thrown in there as well and we do try to be api first so most things go through our api layer and um, we're running on on gcp google cloud with a global load balancer and then ILBs in behind where we have so the web front end and then um, the API sitting next to the webs and then fan out to our internal API that then hit MySQL with a, both memcache and reddish cache, cache layers um, in front of them. Um, we also have a framework that sort of a legacy framework that's been with us forever. We wrote our own. It's not a good idea. There are better frameworks in the world. If you're starting fresh, you sh probably should not write your own framework. Um, we have one. The sort of the, the request routing at Etsy is very, very simple. Everything goes through Apache rewrite rules. Um, so to make the, the URLs pretty, we translate them via rewrite rules from what you see to, to what happens behind the screen. So traditionally it looks something like that. So if you go to something Etsy slash awesome, it'll hit some kind of awesome.php and behind the scenes. Um, that front end script will be very small. It'll basically just kick off the controller, um, pass off a request and the response object, and then instantiate the controller and then start doing whatever cool things this awesome page is doing. In the controller, we 
basically do our cool things, fetch whatever input we need from the get request or the post request, redirect on errors, uh, hit our ORM, uh, and find whatever thing awesome needs to, to do stuff, and then pass it off to our view layer, which is also something that we wrote internally. Um, there's a, there's mustache involved in, in there as well on, on the actual views, but the whole sort of request path is something that was written at Etsy. The views are basically sort of a, a thin layer on top of mustache. So the, the templates are mustache and we then populate the various bits and pieces and get the template data and fill in an array to then um, populate in the actual mustache template like that. Right, standard mustache syntax for that. So the, the stack is pretty simple, which is a big feature when you're trying to debug things and when you're trying to figure out what goes wrong. You want to keep things as simple and fast as possible. We also do a lot of static analysis. We use a tool called FAN which is a project I started while I was at Etsy because we really have, with a growing team of developers, with hundreds of developers, you have to catch mistakes before they get to production. We can't catch everything, but static analysis helps us quite a bit. Um, you can go and grab fan at GitHub fan. Very easy to install. Use composer, composer require, and you can set up a small um, config file that tells where your code is. So if your code mostly lives in the source directory, you tell it. And if you have sort of a traditional composer set up with a vendor directory, you can tell it that's your vendor directory, but you won't get errors from other people's code. It'll include it so it can build its full object tree, but it won't show you errors for it. And then you just run fan on it. Um, you can go look at the, there's a demo that you can click on here when you go and look at the slides and play a little bit around with fan and see what it can do. There's also um, a dependency graph, which is pretty neat. Let's see if I can. So here, this is actually for a open source tool called Grav. And you can go through and with fan, you can generate this dependency tree that basically shows dependencies between classes um, in this tool. And you can do it at different levels um, of dependency. So you can pop back to just one level of dependency. So it's a, it's a nice um little extra thing that you can do um, with fan uh, let me get back and there's also a daemon mode and you can hook up vim to it there's a little video here that can show it but i don't really have time to show it but um go and look at the slide if you want to see the vim integration another tool we wrote at etsy is called php spy very smart guy named adam wrote it and basically what it does it can sample live running PHP and it doesn't, you don't have to instrument it. So you can run it against production servers without any uh, performance impact on it. And they can tell you at samples what PHP is doing. So here I'm sampling it um, every 200 milliseconds on a sleep one. So you see, you get five results. So five times in that one second, I sample to see what it was doing and it's sleeping. So not very interesting. If you attach it to a running process, so here we have a PHP FPM um, running PHP that is serving up WordPress. And here it then shows you that um, this, the call stack at every sample of where, where PHP is. You can also get memory usage on each of those stack frames. Um, and you have a top leg output as well. So you can do a, a minus top, minus minus top. And it gives you kind of like a normal top for processes. This gives you a top of what are the different PHP processes that are running on this machine? What are they currently doing? We use this quite a bit to figure out if things get stuck or take too long, uh, especially like cron jobs written in PHP. Sometimes they just don't die. And it's nice to, to go in and poke and see what is this PHP process doing at this time. You can also generate frame, flame graphs with it, which are pretty cool. So here's a flame graph I generated. Um, this is actually fan. And I was looking at where fan is spending its time. And this flame graph, you can then zoom in and, and see where, where the, the time is being spent. And flame graphs are also a really good debugging tool to try to understand 
where your code is spending its most time and if that time is in the places you expect. So once we have written our code, we have tested it, it's gone through FAN, um, we have to deploy it. And deploying to a very busy website can be tricky. We have to make sure that all our deploys are atomic. We never want like a half written page showing up in production for someone, right? You, every page has to be there and be complete. And you can't, the way we push things with continuous integration, we push 10, 20, 30 times a day sometimes. So we can't take the site down just to push new code to production. So we can't restart servers. We can't remove servers from the load balancer. And we have to make sure we don't cause any sort of thundering herd issues every time we push new code, which means we have to reuse all our caches, or as many caches as possible um, while pushing new code. And the way we do this is that we make sure that we can run two versions of the site concurrently. So we have two doc routes, A and the B. And if the deploy happens here at this red dotted line, there are a bunch of requests that are always happening, right? So no matter when you deploy, there are currently requests that are being served. When this deploy hits, those requests that started on doc root A, they must finish on doc root A. So our web server, basically when the deploy hits, we flip a symlink from A over to B. And now we start serving requests from B, but the ones that were already started on A must finish on A. That way we don't have any sort of um, half written things or, or, or a request that like a checkout, for example, if someone's about to buy something from Etsy and we push code just before the transaction goes through and that code slightly changes things, we don't want those to break, right? So all requests that start on one doc route must finish on that same doc route. And we do this by flipping a symlink. So we flip a symlink for the actual doc root that Apache sees. We flip it from A to B during that. And Nginx, which we're not using, has a built-in feature that lets you set the, basically lets you look at the real path. So the symlink, so the in the configuration for your web server, you're pointing to var www doc root, for example, but that's actually a symlink to either A or B. At the beginning of the request, we look at that symlink and we see, are we on A or are we on B? And we set the document route specifically to A or B. So as far as the request knows, it's on A. And even though we push in the middle of that request, because it doesn't look at the destination or the real path of that symlink um, at any other time other than right at the start of the request, it has no idea that there's a new version running on B. So all requests end up staying on, on the doc route they started on because of this. Apache doesn't have that feature, but I wrote a little uh, Apache module that implements that. It's called mod real doc, and you can get it from Etsy's GitHub page. Mostly because we are we have so much legacy code that relies on Apache. If you're starting fresh, I would say go with Nginx and just use the built-in real path root feature uh, that Nginx has to do this. You have to watch out for a few things. You can't hard code paths. Everything has to be relative to the doc root because the doc root will jump around. Also watch your include path settings. Don't hard code paths in your actual include path. Um, ink path can rewrite the doc roots or the include paths um, uh, for you. So you can have a look at that extension as well. And also obviously version all your static assets. And this doesn't solve DB schema changes. Obviously, if, if you, because you're running two concurrent versions of the code, if those two versions of the code need different DB schemas, you're in trouble. So you need a different mechanism for pushing out database schema changes. But other than that, it's a very, very smooth process. And there is absolutely no performance hit involved in, in pushing a new version of the site. All right, some other thing I've been playing with lately. And this is a feature that's not as well known as it should be, I think. So key value stores are always a really, really important part of a modern PHP site that has to perform well when it's when it's really, really busy. And there are various ways of, of storing things, of caching things. 
So you, you can shove it in, in MySQL. You can shove it, in, shove it in a central data store like MySQL. And here are the read times. And I mean, these are pretty fast. You can see on the left there, these are in milliseconds. So just over 0.1 millisecond to read from a remote uh, MySQL server on, on the right over here, right? PHP array on the left is essentially zero. If we zoom in a little bit, whoops, that's not zooming in very much. Well, um, it's still kind of zero. And you can see this PHP array one is basically free. We're now down under like 0 0.0001 milliseconds. We're in the nanoseconds range of, of reading from it. What this is, is an include file that you simply, you put a PHP array into an include file and include it. That then loads the entire thing into opcache. And the way opcache works, it doesn't just cache opcodes. It also caches both arrays and objects. And those arrays and objects are linked to the files that they came from. So by including this file, you are simply pointing directly at this array in memory. You're not touching the disk. You're not even running, executing the opcodes. You are simply getting a pointer to a shared memory spot. So looking up, for example, Etsy uses it to store the configuration for the entire application is in the PHP array that we include because each configuration lookup is super, super, super fast. Now, there's another um, technology called Yak. And Yak is also really fast. It's also a shared memory cache, but it's a little bit slower um, for lookups. Um, misses are not quite as expensive. So this is a lookup miss. If, if you try to look up an array entry that doesn't exist in a PHP array, you end up getting a notice saying this doesn't exist. And that generating that notice and going through the error, even if you swallow it, that takes a little bit of execution time, but not much. You can see we're below 0 0.005 milliseconds. Yak's miss is, is less. Obviously, local memcache is, is pretty fast as well, point, under 0 0.02. If we reset the zoom, you can see. And you're obviously giving up things as you're moving up here in times. I mean, this is a distributed centralized data store, right, that all servers can access. These fast ones, Yak and the PHP array, are per server. So you can write to them. And writes are, are pretty slow for, for a remote MySQL server. Um, if we zoom in even further, you can see writes are actually very, very cheap on, on the on Yak. Writes are not so cheap on a PHP array, which might surprise you a little bit. But what happens is when you have one of these PHP arrays, you really only want to put read-only stuff in it because as soon as you write to it, you change it. And that means you can't have a shared copy in, in the opcache. It means that the entire array has to be copied down into request memory space. So that's why a write to, to one of these arrays, um, one of these cached arrays is really, really expensive. So a PHP array you would only want to use for, um, for read-only stuff. If you need a local machine read-write cache, I would really suggest you, you use Yak because Yak is just very, very fast. But again, it's, it's per machine, obviously. So it doesn't really replace a centralized remote memcache. If you're looking at installing a sort of a local memcache per machine, then you should really be looking at Yak instead because it is quite a bit faster. Anyway, this is just stuff that I've been looking at in the last week or so. I figured I would make a slide on it because I, I find it interesting. All right. If you are not on at least PHP 7.3 at this point, you are running completely unsupported uh, versions of PHP. And even 7.3, you need to get off of it by the end of this year um, because we're not going to be putting out security fixes for, for 7.3 anymore. Try to get on to 8.0. 8.1 is coming um, probably in another two months or so. Um, but 8.0 is out there. Speed-wise, you'll also, if you're not on 7.3, I mean, if you're on PHP 5, you're kind of lucky. It's kind of sad you're still on PHP 5, but you're kind of lucky because you have a lot of performance coming to you. From 5 to 7, there was a huge performance jump, mostly because of some of the very fancy tricks that I just talked about in opcache, the way we cache arrays and objects directly without having to actually execute the opcodes. We just point scripts directly at these cached uh, objects in, in shared memory. 
um, without copying anything around unless you write to them. But even after PHP 7, you can see that we have we have added a bit of performance along the way, at least for WordPress, which is sort of my standard testing um, platform. But, it, but it's mostly across the board um, that we get these performance increases. So you're not going to get a lot going from 7.3 to 8, but there's a little bit, a couple of percentage points, most likely. All right, PHP 8, just a very quick summary of, of new things in PHP 8. One of the big things is named arguments. So before, you, if you're calling HTML special chars, right, and you needed to change, you needed to change the last um, parameter to this call, you'd have to specify all the parameters, um, and then specify. Even though you wanted the defaults, it doesn't matter. There's no way of skipping and only specifying the ones you're interested in. With named arguments, you can just call it like this. Now you can say double encode false, and the ones in between will just get the defaults instead. There's also constructor property promotion. So this basically means instead of having to define properties and then saying this first name equals dollar first name that's being passed in, if you specify the, the PPP, the access level uh, directly in the constructor parameter definition here, then these will automatically become properties and get assigned uh, those, those values which removes a bunch of boilerplate code and just makes things look a little bit nicer. There's also a new null safe operator. So question mark um, arrow. This basically, instead of having to check for nulls all the way along one of these chained set of calls, this basically will short circuit and, and stop. If say session user is null, it won't try to call get address on, on a null. It, it'll skip out, it'll error out there instead, um, instead of having to check each one along the way. There's also a match expression. Um, it's kind of like switch, but because it's an expression instead of a, a language statement, it can return a value. You can't say $A equals switch something, but you can say statement equals match. And the way it works is you can then, basically the syntax is like this. Um, if there's no default, then if none of the matches are there, you get an error, an unhandled match error. You can catch them. You, you can do a try catch around it and catch this particular one. Or if there's a default, obviously you can you can handle it that way. The normal switch way of doing this would look something like this, but even then, you can see you have to assign statement every time in here. And here you can just do the statement assignment once. So in, in certain situations, match makes boilerplate code a lot, lot nicer looking. Also union types, we're probably all familiar with PHP doc style uni um, union types, the way we can say parameters, int or string, um, and we can give it multiple types. And you couldn't do that in, in PHP 7. You can only put a single type in the actual hard type, as I call it, um, at the PHP level. If you need the multiple types for a variable, you'd have to do it at PHP doc level and let something like fan um, check it for you. It wouldn't be checked at runtime. In PHP 8, you can now do union types um, directly in PHP and it will be checked at runtime. So you can just say, this can be an int or a string, the int float or string. You can see if you then store something here, I'm putting an array into the second argument. This doesn't say it can take an array. So you get an argument, a type error saying this is not an array. Weak maps. Weak maps are kind of a complex feature. It's mostly used for caching. PHP internally is reference counted. So that means that when you assign a variable a equals one, this dollar a or this, this one, this bucket that has the number one in it has a reference count of one because dollar a is pointing to it. If you then say dollar $B equals dollar $A, now you have a reference count of dollar $B equals um, reference dollar $A. Now you have a reference count of two. The problem with it is if you have a cache and you have a, a sort of a cached version of this, then once dollar $A goes out of scope, because the cache is holding on to, to has a reference to, to that bucket, then it won't get garbage collected. 
if you don't want your cache to prevent garbage collection, you can use weak maps. And that way, that reference from the cache won't count as a reference count, which means once the main variable goes out of scope, then garbage collection will kick in and, and free up that memory for the remainder of the request. And you can have a look at this example and then read through it to try to get a, a handle on how that actually works. Attributes. Again, this is a bit of a complex feature that's mostly useful for library authors. But basically, you can define attributes that will then um, be checked at, at runtime using this syntax here. Um, here's a doctrine version of it, but various attribute implementations can use this. You can either do like multiples with commas in between, or you can do one per line. Um, basically, standard att attributes. PHP 8.1, which is coming out in two months or so, has some more new things. And actually, also for PHP 8.0, if you want more details on these, there's a wiki, wiki.php.net slash RFC, where each of these new features is described in great, great detail. All the edge cases and things tend to be described. They're even better than in the documentation most times. So if you're interested in one of these new features, head over to the RFC. There's a section with 8.0 ones and another one with 8.1. This one, one of the big new things in PHP 8.1 is read-only properties. So you have a new read-only key keyword you can assign on the property. If you try to write to it, you get an error. Simple enough, right? Uh, enums. Enums is basically, it's based on the class implementation in PHP. So most things work just like a class. Um, there are a few exceptions. And again, this RFC in great detail will explain exactly how it works. But in the simple case, right, you set up an enum. These are the four valid cases. If you pass in something that doesn't match and you have defined this method to take enum suit and you pass in a string spades, you get an error. You have to pass in one of the enums for it to not error. Fibers. Another complex feature that's not going to be used by most PHP developers. Again, this is a library level feature. It's essentially cooperative multitasking where you can, you can yield a bit like a generator. You can yield um, execution and let other parts of the code um, execute at that point. So you basically, the, your code cooperates with itself to let other parts run. Um, so promises can be implemented that way. So this is a React. So React promises could be implemented um, using this. And again, I, I can't explain in, in, in one minute exactly how, how the fibers work. But again, the RFC, lots and lots of details in there if you're interested in that. Static variable inheritance. This is kind of a, a weird edge case where if you have a static variable in a method, then you extend that class. Then before, if you called that same method in class B, that would have its own copy of static variables. So it was even in inherited classes, each method would have its own copy of static variables. So if you run this code here, where you call counter A, um, counter in class A twice, and then call it twice and counter in class B, then you would see one, two, one, two, because you'd have two different ones. In PHP 8.1, we've changed that. And it makes a little bit more sense that you just have a single copy of the static variable. So in PHP 8.1, this exact example will print out one, two, three, four, because there's just one. There's also a never return type which does exactly what it suggests. This function never returns. You call it and you're dead, you exit, um, you don't return. There's also final class constants now. Um, just means that you can't inherit a class and override the constant if it's been marked final in the parent. Now you can also do new in initializers. So an initializer is when you have a constructor, just like we saw in PHP 8.0, where you can define properties. 
Now the value of one of these properties can actually be set to a class. You couldn't do this before. You couldn't put a new right in the constructor parameter definition like this. So this code here is PHP 8.1 equivalent of what this would have been in, in PHP 8.0. Um, first class callables. This is another feature that makes boilerplate code a little bit nicer looking. So if you wanted a closure, you basically wanted to pass around um, a closure that just calls an internal function like stringling, or maybe not an internal function, could also be um, a user level function. Either way, um, you had various ways of doing it. Like for an internal function like this, you could do it like this for a class. If you're within that, class you can do this method in, in previous versions or you can be more precise and this this syntax with arrays is kind of hacky I, i've never really liked it but we never had a better way of doing it now we do in php 8.1 this um dot 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 syntax it's not me trying to make my slide shorter this is the actual syntax that just says give me a stringling give me a closure with stringling with, I don't care what the arguments are. We'll, I'll worry about that later, but just give me a closure. And then you can call this closure with whatever argument stringling normally takes. And same thing, if you're just calling it this method, you can do it this way. And this third one would translate to this syntax. Okay, and the last major one. There are, there are other features in 8.1. This is basically just a set of highlights, but the last one is pure intersection types. Remember in 8.0, we introduced union types. And the difference between intersection and union is basically an or versus an and, right? So we had a union type that could either be an int or a string. So int or string. Here we have an intersection type. Instead of having an or, we have an and. So here we're saying this countable iterator has to implement both traversable and countable. So if we pass in something that does not implement both of these interfaces, then we get a type error on this call. This is not as useful as union types. It's not as many times you have to restrict something to implement multiple things, but with intersection types, you now can. All right, that was a lot of boring low level PHP stuff some more interesting things, at least to me. To me, PHP is just a tool. It's not a religion. It's not that important. It's not really that interesting. Um, I've been quoted a few times as saying that PHP is about as interesting as your toothbrush. I mean, it's extremely useful. It solves a problem, but it's still just a damn toothbrush. It's what you build. I was going to say what you build with your toothbrush, but you don't build anything with a toothbrush. But with PHP, this boring tool, you can build some amazing things. This is me hacking on some PHP stuff about a little over 19 years ago. I can tell because that's my son, Carl, on my fake Apple laptop. A couple of days after he was born, me sitting in the hospital. I think that's a Wi-Fi gateway behind me there. I don't remember, actually. Carl getting a little older, still working on PHP. Um, this was in an airport, I think. I, I don't know. We're probably flying to some PHP conference somewhere. This is Carl in his PHP shirt. I think this was in Germany at some PHP conference. He used to love running around the place, turning off computers in all the booths. And the people there were not super happy about it, but everyone knew he was my son, so they couldn't really say anything. And he had a ton of fun always being able to find the off button on these computers. Um, this was, I used to go to Australia every year. And oh, um, in Australia, did I lose my, my video? So in our in yeah, Australia, we lose your we lose your uh, your presentation. Sorry, Rasmus. Okay, hold on. Let me. Yeah. I need to reshare it. Uh, yep. Okay, hold on. Wonder how that happened. Chrome tab, modern PHP. There we are. Is it back? Yeah. I'll okay. I'll, I'll step up. 
Okay, sorry about that, folks. Technical problems. Um, so this is in Australia somewhere. Uh, the tall guy there on the left is Tridge. The other guy in the middle is Linus Torvalds. You should probably all know who Linus is. You might not know who Tridge is, but Tridge wrote Rsync, which you probably all used. He wrote Samba. He was also the guy who hacked BigKeeper famously by just telnetting to, to the port 5000 and, and playing around with it, which caused Linus to get a little bit upset and start writing Git. So Tridge also sort of in, inadvertently caused everyone to get Git many years later. Um, but these hacking, and you can see how long ago it was because of all the CRTs in the background there. Um, but these hacking sessions that we had in Australia were amazing where lots and lots of open source folks would gather and just sit and play with things and argue. I think Dredge was arguing about some very obscure detail in the Linux kernel with, with Linus at this point. Um, it was a lot of fun. Um, this was a conference in India. So I'm going through some of this stuff because this is what PHP has meant to me over the years. And, and some of the, the what I find to be more important than PHP itself. Um, just the people that I meet and the experiences around it. This is me in a suit. If you know me at all, you've never ever seen me in a suit and I've never shown up at a conference in a suit. This is the Indians photoshopping me into a suit because they didn't think it was appropriate. The photo that I had sent them in a t-shirt was not appropriate for their fancy conference. So they photoshopped me into a suit, which I found extremely funny. And these huge posters, this is a small version they were posted. There were these huge billboards all over the city as well uh, with me in a suit, which was very, very odd. This was in Sri Lanka. And the guy sitting there holding a book is Arthur C. Clarke. Or well, was, was Arthur C. Clarke. He died a few months after I went there. But he sat in the front row, and I taught him PHP. And that's just amazing. I'm a huge science fiction fan, and he's one of the greatest science fiction authors of all time. And getting to teach him PHP was a ton of fun for me. And he actually paid attention. He asked questions, and he, he seemed to be interested, which was very, very cool. And so that then the, the end of this is you saw, you saw this guy, right? Baby. This year, Carl joined me at Etsy as an intern. So there were two Leardorfs working working for Etsy. And as a as a proud dad, that's really, really, really cool um, to basically get to work with your son. Not directly. He wasn't on the same team that my mom or anything. But working at the same company is a lot of fun. I've been doing this for a very long time. Um, this is sort of my progression of different companies I've worked for over the years. And in my 10th or even longer, I started as a technical advisor for Etsy. So I've been around Etsy for 12 years now, I think, um, but 10 years as a full-timer. Long time in the industry. The only reason I've lasted this long, I think, is because I, I love what I'm doing. and. I sit there, I think of myself as a hacker. I am not a very good programmer. I'm definitely not in the in the why here on anywhere over here. I can code. I can write code and I'm not terrible at it, but I'm nowhere near the best programmer on any team I've ever been on. I'm also a bit of a dreamer, but I know enough about the technology that my dreams are realistic, I think. And and I think that's where interesting things happen. If you dream and code, and you can marry those two, very, very cool things happen. There's absolutely no reason why I should have been the one that wrote PHP. There are much better programmers in the world. But I thought the world needed that tool. Well, I needed that tool, really, in the beginning. I didn't really care about other people, but I was trying to solve the web problem. And with this, by, by dreaming a little bit and saying this should not be as hard as uh, something like IBM's WebSphere was making it way back then, 30 years ago, not 30, but 27 years ago or so. Um, it was just way too complicated. We needed a simpler way of solving the web problem. And that's what PHP was and, and still is today. And also what keeps me going is this famous quote from Tim O'Reilly. 
says that you should try to create more value than you capture, both as a person and as a company. It's one of the reasons I work for Etsy. I really believe that Etsy creates more value for its customers um, than we extract from them. And the same cannot be said for a lot of companies out there on the internet, as far as I'm concerned. And then also what keeps me going is I work on things that matter to me. Um, and hopefully it matters to other people as well. Part of that is things like this. So there is a, a, a software project called Sahana. This was actually something that started shortly after I visited Sri Lanka, where I taught Arthur C. Clarke PHP. There had been a, a tsunami and then a, a tidal wave and flood and a bunch of people died in Sri Lanka. And one of the kids I met at the university where I was speaking had lost his grandmother and he was devastated, understandably. He wanted to do something. And we discussed it and we, we said he that we sort of talked about what happened and why why did why did so many people die? And he said it wasn't really the flooding, it was the disease and the help and the infrastructure not being in place so that people died afterwards. And people died because they just did not get clean water, they didn't get medicine, they didn't get things they needed in time. So a complete logistics issue, which happens a lot, especially in less developed countries, when disaster hits, it's really hard to get the right aid to the right people at the right time. So they started the software project called Sahana. And Sahana is basically disaster recovery and disaster relief in a box. So very, very quick to spin up things like a people locator. And these days they also have um, both iPhone and Android apps. So a people locator, rescue teams will enter in, ask the name of the person they found, and then they will bring them to a shelter and then enter into the thing uh, where they left this person. And then the web interface or with an app, you can go and ask, hey, where have you found my grandmother and where is she? Very simple things like this. Same with keeping track of where foreign aid that arrives at the airport. Which hangar are the diapers in? Which hangar is the clean water in? Um, and how much do we have and where? who needs it? most at this time. So all the logistics like this. This software has now been used in over 50 different uh, natural disasters all over the world. And there's a very nice quote from the Secretary of National Defense of the Philippines many years ago now, um, specifically talking about Sahana and how it helped the Philippines in one of their natural disasters, that no innovation matters more than that which saves lives. And this is what it's all about. PHP itself does not matter. It's a tool. It's a toothbrush. It's what we build. It's how we change people's lives. And software development in general, we get too focused on the tools themselves. And we argue about the tools. We play around with the tools. And it's completely irrelevant. It's what we build with our tools that matter. And it's what we build that can change the world. So thank you. And I think we can do some, some Q&A. Thank you, Rasmus. Uh, it was a great talk, you know, uh, to be honest, like, um, you know, really inspiring, I, I can say straight up. Uh, but uh, yeah, we have some some time for questions. We will, uh, everyone, please begin submitting them. Um, and let me just begin. Uh, Sagrari, you had a couple of more things to say, right? Yeah, if you didn't get participate, as Mariano said, in this virtual talk, Send us your question via Facebook or YouTube chats. We'd love to hear about from you. We are we already have a lot of comments, a very nice comments about you, your talk, Rasmus. Thank you so much. And you okay, can also <laughs> tag us on Twitter uh, at phpmx or using the Meetup Slack channel. And before we start to, <laughs> with the questions, please let me introduce to. Uh, yeah, today we also have the participation of other members of the Etsy team, uh, Rachana Kumar. Uh, he's, she's manager director at Etsy Mexico. Welcome, Rachana. If the backstage can help me to, <laughs> to add her to the screen. And we have also Leo. The, uh, he's principal yeah, yeah. Here they are. <laughs> yeah, they are here for answer 
questions uh, about Etsy also. Thanks Perfect. for joining us. So it's questions time, Rasmus. Um, you know, there were so many questions from the audience. Um, I'm going to try to to pick up a couple of them. Okay. Uh, one question was, is your son the same age as PHP? <laughs> <laughs> no, I started PHP in about 1993, and my son was not born until 2002. So PHP is about nine years older than Carl. OK, perfect, perfect. There was another question around here. There's a lot of, you know, I think you were talking a little bit too much about PHP being a tool, right? And there's like uh, not being a religion, right? And and I, I agree with you that probably I think, and, and we, we say this uh, often on the community, you know, we are a community that was created by our passion for the, the language, for the tools that we were building. But now we have become, you know, friends, a community. Some people are not even working with PHP current in their professional experience. They are still part of the community. You know, I think uh, it has uh, all these meetups. You know, I think even if they are virtual, you know, I, I think they help a little bit to bring the people in um, and talk about it, which is, I think it's great. Yeah. I have a question here from Juan Bautista. How will you see PHP in five years? Where do you think the scope of the language is going? I get this question often, and it kind of depends on where the, the web is going. PHP is a web language first. So if the web moves in a certain direction, P, PHP is sure to follow that direction. And it's really hard to predict where the web is going to be five years from now. I remember getting this question, I don't know, I think 15 years ago. And at that point, it looked like microformats. And mm. microformats would sort of take over and we would get the perfect semantic web where all components of web pages are, are described in, with semantic tags. So we know exactly what this web page gives us. And all the signs pointed at the semantic web. And it never happened. Nobody cared. Right. Nobody implemented microformats. Companies tried. It didn't go anywhere. Um, so I've given up on trying to predict where where things are going. Um, PHP generally follows. Uh, okay. And we, we follow where where things are going. But I mean, in the last couple of years, you've probably seen the features we've been adding, and you saw the 8.0 and the 8.1 features. We're picking up useful features from other languages. And that's a tradition of PHP, even from the very beginning. I didn't design a new language. I kind of cobbled together a language based on things that I liked from the languages I used. So I used Perl and I used C. Um, I used some awk, right? And, and those things migrated into PHP. We're seeing features from Java coming in. We're fe seeing features from Go, Kotlin, um, and a bunch of different languages are now influencing PHP. And I think that will continue to happen over the next couple of years, where features that are popular in other languages will probably pop up in PHP as well. Thank you. There are so many questions. I cannot even, you know, like, I cannot even keep up. I'm, just, I'm going to post two. Um, I'm just going to post it in Spanish, but I'll translate it for you. It says, I have only been using PHP for web applications, but I, I, I understand that you can also make desktop applications. Is that correct? And then wait for me, Rasmus. Uh, is there like, are there any PHP libraries for neural networks? Uh, it could be for a web application or any other environment. So I think this, these two can be combined into like, like doing like, something that may not be the that core may not of be it. web. Yeah. Generally, PHP is a very thin wrapper on top of lower level libraries. So if there's a low level library that does like written in C or C++ generally, that does neural network stuff. Um, and same for, for desktop things. There's a GTK extension, for example, that just maps all the GTK desktop calls directly into PHP. So yes, of course, it's possible to do both in PHP. Um, it requires that someone wraps these libraries. And I am sure I don't know offhand what the neural, the popular neural network libraries out there are. Um, I'm sure there's a PHP wrapper for some of them. If there isn't, 
if this is something you need, it's actually really, really easy to wrap the library. Um, there are automatic tools to help do it, or you could do it manually. And it, it's a weekend project. If you know the, the underlying language, if you know C well, it's a weekend project to, to wrap just about any C callable library. Um, so yes, it, it is possible to use PHP for those cases. I tend to not use PHP for everything. Um, I use whatever is the best tool for the job, right? And my son, I mean, people think he must be a great PHP expert. He knows his PHP. He worked at Etsy. He, he brought a ton of PHP, but he's written even more Java. He's currently working for a company and he's writing Python mostly, doing some data science stuff in Python. He's written a ton of C Sharp. So as a developer, you need to be able to use multiple languages. And just because you can write something in PHP doesn't mean you necessarily should. OK, perfect. Um, I have another question. I don't know where, where I left it on the on the chat because it's just going very fast. But I, I, I had it here. Like, What do you think of Visual Studio Code to develop in PHP? Is it recommended, or is it there one that is more suitable for PHP, talking about free tools? Yeah, I, I really don't know. Um, I use VI. Okay. <laughs> so... <laughs> you are one of those, huh? <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, we have, we have uh, both. We have VS Code folks and we have PHP Storm developers at Etsy that both swear that theirs is the best IDE for it. And I'm sitting there in my VI and it's like, I don't know what you're doing with your fancy clickety-click things, but my, my VI works perfectly well. Thank you very much. Perfect. I have another question. Uh, what best practice enable Etsy's product development culture? What best practices is that? Yes. Um, I, I I don't know. Um, <laughs> I, I think we I think we saw that we focus on the on the product and the customers, right? And that's that should go for any company. Uh, it's yeah. you you focus on on what the customers need, both the sellers and the buyers. Um, we tend to cater a lot to the sellers at Etsy because if we can drive the sellers, um, that drives the buyers and it becomes this loop that just keeps going and going, right? If we piss off the sellers, then they sell less and there's less things to buy. Um, so I, it, it's pretty simple. I mean, build the best product for your customers. It's one of the reasons I joined Etsy. I was at Yahoo before, and Yahoo was a fun company. It was a great company to work for, but we always had this tension between the advertising folks. Like I worked a little bit on Yahoo Mail, for example, hmm. and the only way Yahoo Mail, Mail made money was by plastering ads all over the web interface for Yahoo Mail. And when we needed to make more money, we would put more ads on it, essentially making the product worse. So it was always this tension between the engineers wanting to build the best possible product and the money people wanting to make the most possible money. And those two goals did not line up at all. Because in order to make more money, we had to make the product worse. At Etsy, we make more money if the product gets better. We don't have to make the product worse to make more money. It's completely in line. And that's I think that's what drives a, a decent product at Etsy. And that's one of the reasons I'm at, I'm at Etsy, because I really hated having to deliberately make the product worse by putting more and more annoying ads into this, this interface. Yeah, and I think thank I you. have a, <laughs> thank you. Do yeah, you want I to add? add to, yeah, what Rasmus was saying, thank you for that comparison of ads versus making the product better for buyers and sellers, Rasmus. I'm managing director for Etsy Mexico, but I'm also VP of engineering on the product engineering team. So we think day in, day out, how do we build the best product for our buyers and sellers? One of the core things I think what also makes Etsy a little different from, you know, all of my past jobs is all teams and most importantly for me, engineering teams are also actively involved in decision making of all product outcomes, right? Like. A lot of places I've worked in the past, the product manager, designer, analysts, people on the business side would make the decision on what the feature should be. And engineers would focus on um, just executing it. Whereas at Etsy, engineers are involved in the process end to end. 
And we also, Erasmus already mentioned, you know, we push code multiple times a day to production. So we try to look at both, like, you know, we set up A-B tests actively for almost every feature we push. And it's very, you know, based, very much based on both um, qualitative analysis and quantitative insights that we get. And I think that makes it really exciting because we really hear what our customers want through research, but also we look at how it's performing once we launch the feature. And based on that, we make decisions and keep iterate, you know, iterating on what we are building. So yeah, I think that's part of what product development looks like at Etsy. Yeah. And I have another question, I think, um, it, and it goes on the same line. So. Rasmus, you were saying your 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 son, he is a Python developer, right? Uh, that means that, you know, that does it look like Etsy is like a, a language agnostic around recruiting and around the technologies that they are using, for example, or they are only using mainly PHP and I don't know, some Python? No, I mean, I might, just to make it clear, my son is not working for Etsy currently. That was his oh. previous job. Okay, okay, okay. Um, he's he's an intern. He's a he's at the University of Waterloo. It's a co-op program. He keeps he gets four months work terms. Okay. So he switches every four months. He switches around. So he's at a different company now doing Python. But there are people, plenty of people doing Python at Etsy as well. And yes, any large company have like dozens, well, a dozen languages in in flight at any one point. Um, so yes, you don't have to be a PHP geek to work at Etsy. It helps because a lot of the web code is in, is in PHP, but there are people in the search team, for example, and people working on our mobile apps that don't touch PHP at all. It helps to be able to read some PHP because you're calling into APIs written in PHP. So if you can read it, it helps you a bit. So you understand what's going on. Um, but yeah, no, we hire across all kinds of different languages and technologies. And I can teach PHP to you in like a weekend. Give me a break. It's not hard to learn. Exactly. And just jumping in here quickly. And, and hello, everyone. Uh, thank you all for coming today. I'm a principal tech recruiter uh, here at Etsy, supporting uh, Mexico in particular. Uh, and just to kind of add on to that, I think that a lot of our hiring pipelines, even for teams that work in PHP every day, um, we don't really prioritize individuals that have PHP experience in particular. Uh, and we really actually don't look for too much domain experience. We look really to, to give candidates the opportunity to show the breadth of their experience and what they've learned there too. Uh, and we default to really expanding the profiles that we look for here too. So we actually normally uh, don't have coding questions in PHP in particular, and we actually look for more so individuals that can you know, ask questions to clarify a problem. Uh, and we're more interested in how someone does that and scopes out a problem than we are um, someone knowing a specific language or a specific syntax. Um, and to Rasmus's point, I think we're really confident in, in kind of the learning culture we have uh, to help onboard uh, a lot of engineers, even if they don't have experience in our tech stack before too. Um, and I think the last piece of that as well is just making sure that our interviews are practical, um, you know, and test skills that candidates are actually going to use on a day-to-day -day basis. And I think that that's helped us really not limit ourselves, only look looking for people that have specific backgrounds or, you know, experience with our direct tech stack. Yeah. And, and honestly, the syntax of the language, whatever languages is, when you're coming into a company like Etsy that's as big and has as much code, you're going to have bigger problems understanding the architecture and how all the pieces fit together than whether you need a dollar sign or not on, on this particular thing. That's something you can look up in like five seconds, understanding the architecture behind it and how the APIs, which API to call and stuff. That's the harder part of it. The language part you'll pick up. It's, it's impossible not to pick that up. And if you have any experience at all in any language, if you're smart, we need you at Etsy. Okay, now that uh, Leo Rasmus uh, helped me not to clarify some questions about Etsy. Uh, what does Etsy do to ensure they are innovating and not having a stagnant tech stack? Uh, innovating on our tech stack? Um, we don't. We don't care. We don't prioritize innovating the tech stack. We prioritize innovating the product. If the product needs something that the tech stack cannot provide then we fix the tech stack. Um, and luckily, I work at Etsy, so I can fix most things in, in the, in the PHP-based tech stack. But no, it, it's, 
it's the wrong way to look at it if you're prioritizing your tech stack over your product, right? If the product doesn't need something from the tech stack, then there's no point wasting time on that, right? So just, just to be cool, it's not a reason to implement something at Etsy. And it's not a reason to bring in a technology just because everyone else is doing it. If we don't need it, and if we're if the tool that we currently have in whatever, it's an API, a library, whatever, um, if it works and meets our needs, we stick with it. We don't introduce new things that can de destabilize the stack for, for no real reason. And there's actually quite a bit of pushback sometimes of bringing in new technologies. You have to really make a good case for why we need one more technology that we need to manage and maintain um, and keep at production quality level at all times. Because even though it seems like a simple thing, the simplest change can, can cause problems. Um, so th there is some pushback against innovating on the tech stack. And it, it, it goes along with product design and, and, and the, sort of the whole product curve um, when we push things onto the tech stack. Yeah, 100% agree with Rasmus. I can give a clear example of where it made sense for the product and for our customers. Uh, one of the groups I work very closely with is our mobile apps group, both uh, native apps and the MWeb group, right? So. We really look at like where are the business trends going and how will it help our sellers and buyers. Couple of examples of that are, of course, we use uh, Kotlin and Swift on on iOS and Android, but we we also like a couple of years ago looked at cross-platform technologies on native apps such as Flutter, Kotlin native. Does any of them make sense? And we felt like for our seller ops, Flutter is a potential good option. And we started using Flutter. And similarly, we are currently building a new progressive web app for our MWeb experience. But that was very much based on our buyer base growing in developing economies such as like India and Latin America. And we really wanted to give a native like experience on MWeb as well. So it's very much driven by what our product and customers need, as Rasmus said. Perfect. Um, I have to let, um, just for everyone, you know, we had a, a side, um, a side uh, streaming in Spanish, and we're going to cut that, but I, I still want to get at least five more questions out from you, Rasmus. Yeah. You know, we have no over 200 people uh, connected, so I am ending that, that streaming, and we are still staying okay. here in English. So I have a question here from, from Eclipse. You know, he's part of the PHP Mexico community. He also created uh, his uh, a library uh, in PHP, an open source library, just FYI, yeah, for, for invoicing in Mexico that connects with the equivalent of the IRS in Mexico. So his question is, what do you consider could be the next performance boost? Like the one from 5.6 to 7 oh? I don't think we're going to get another one at that magnitude. It's going to, because that was kind of a revolution of, of PHP performance going from five to seven. Because we sat down and we looked at memory usage and we we were just simply in PHP 5, we we're simply copying too much stuff around. And we've got everything down to zero copy now. And we can't go below zero. So there isn't, that. that's where the big boost comes is, is reducing memory use and reducing the amount of copies of that memory you do um, you make so i mean the jit can help a little bit so the jit that came just his time yeah yeah that helps a little bit with certain types of scripts most web apps are not going to get much of a boost with the jit now if you are generating a fractal in php yes if you're doing non-web stuff in php the jit can be revolutionary your fractal can be 10 maybe 15 times faster with the jit um, but when you're simply calling and, and making database queries to MySQL, for example, right, it's limited how much we can speed that up. We can, we could speed that up from five to seven because we were making multiple copies of the result set coming back from MySQL. And when you're passing it around, there are copies being made. There is zero copies at this point. You still need the one set of results from, from the database. But once you have that set of results in database, as long as you make no copies of it, there's not much to, to increase in performance there. Um, Preloading is a feature we added that also helps in certain cases. It basically takes 
libraries that don't change very often um, that, so that things that you're not pushing out to, you're not deploying very often, can get preloaded at server startup and basically become part of, of PHP internals, if you will. It'll look like an internal function, anything you define, or internal classes, anything you define in the preloaded file shows up as if it was internal and there's no performance hit on that. So if you do some creative preloading of the right things, maybe do a bit of JIT in the right places, FFI, if you know your C or C++, you can get some really good performance boosts there. But these are all things that are not as sort of across the board and you don't have to do anything like the PHP 5 to PHP 7 performance boost was. I don't see us getting another one like that, unfortunately. I would love to be proven wrong, though. Okay. Um, we'll see. Maybe Nikita can come up with something crazy. Uh, <laughs> we'll see. We'll see. All right, I have another question here from Danny Ramirez. He says, I've been using PHP since 2003. I learned a PHP framework two years ago. I still prefer native PHP. What are the advantages that PHP have over a framework? I mean, it probably has, but. Uh, so, I mean, I'm obviously, I tend to do native PHP myself. Um, I'm probably the wrong person to ask about frameworks. Many years ago, when the first set of frameworks came about, I was very anti-framework because they were a huge monolithic thing and you had to buy into the entire framework. Um, you couldn't pick and choose just the pieces of them that you wanted. Um, and the performance hit on some of these frameworks were just atrocious. And it was really depressing to see just how slow some PHP apps got because they had chosen one of these frameworks. In the last 10 years or so, that has improved a ton. Now with Composer, you can pick out pieces of Symfony and pieces of Laravel and only use the, the bits that you need for your particular application. So I, it's a bad idea not to use other people's code. You're gonna spend way too long. I mean, you could probably write a more perfect piece of code for your particular use case, but you'll never finish your project. So if you the way we can pick and choose now components of frameworks out there um, if you pick and choose the right bits and pieces you can be much more productive and get a solution out to to your customers much much quicker by doing so um so i i'm a big proponent of, of sort of piecemeal frameworks these days and not necessarily buying into an entire framework but pick pick and choose the bits and pieces that you need um, and we have been doing more of that at etsy in the past couple of years where we're pulling in more and more composer-based libraries um, and sometimes deleting Etsy-written code that was sort of, yeah, it worked, but it, it wasn't as, as complete as some of the composer libraries out there are today. What, what about you? Um, what, what are your thoughts, uh, Rachina, on this? On the framework process, I think Rasmus covered it. Rasmus not said best. So. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, I have another question here. If you can go back in time and change some of the old PHP Rasmus, what would it be? This is like, you know, this is like an interview question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, I probably should have changed the the uppercase lowercase handling in the early days of PHP because right now um, there's no PHP is case sensitive in certain things and not case sensitive in in other things and it's a little bit confusing um, but other than that I mean that to me that's the biggest thing at the same time though if you if you have a if you have two functions or two classes that only differ in case that's really damn confusing as well. So you probably shouldn't be doing that, right? Um, but still, that, that, and the reason that's like that is because in the early days of the web, there was a huge religious war of whether HTML tags should be uppercase, lowercase, or sometimes even mixed case. And I didn't want to be in the middle of that battle. And because the way PHP was embedded in HTML, uh, especially in the early days where people just had everything in one file, um, I just, well, use whatever case you want, uppercase, lowercase, PHP doesn't care. Choose whatever religion you like. Um, and, I, and that just never changed from then. 
Okay. And other than that, I mean, people always ask me about s some of the other features that they don't particularly like. Um, like register globals is one that comes up a lot. <laughs> Without register globals, we wouldn't have PHP. Honestly, register Drop globals. The mic. Was a Register, register globals was a thing for people who don't know. It's an old feature that's gone, um, but it was that basically get post cookie variables could automatically become global variables in your application. So if you were to write a form, for example, that collected your age, first name, and last name, whatever the form fields, whatever the in your HTML name equals age, name equals first, name equals last, you would have dollar age, dollar name or dollar first, dollar last. And it was so easy to explain to people how to write PHP code that took data you get from a web application or you get from a web page and put it into a database or, in, or do other things with it. And the fact that it was so easy to build dynamic web applications with PHP without having to worry about request objects and response objects or anything like that, it meant that people used PHP to solve their problems. And then they figured out, okay, well, there are some better ways of doing some of this, but you also have to remember that JavaScript didn't even exist in the early days of PHP. There was no such thing as cross-site scripting. So some of the reasons for not doing this came later. Yeah. And it's like people look at it now going, well, how could you possibly have done this? Well, it was done in a very, very different world that didn't have the same restrictions and the same security um, platform that we do today because today JavaScript is crazy. The things you can do in JavaScript is amazing, right? And you can really screw up someone's browser and, and get all kinds of stuff. Um, back then that just didn't exist because JavaScript didn't exist. Um, so yeah, a lot of those things that people think I will answer to this is just no. <laughs> It, at the time, a lot of these decisions were right. And people also ask me about argument order and how, why is PHP so inconsistent on argument order? It's completely consistent, just not in the way you expect. Exactly. And <laughs> <laughs> so it's, it's, it's vertically consistent versus horizontally consistent in the sense that just about every function name and its arguments are a reflection of the underlying library that it implements. So um, substring or stringling and, and all these names of functions and also the parameters, it match directly the, the C level functions that they implement. And people have said, well, why doesn't stringling have an underscore in it? Because that should be the convention. It's like, no, stringling is a thing. Any C developer in the world knows that stringling is stringling. It does not have an underscore in it. It's, <laughs> it's, it's not string length, it's stringling. It's, it's, it's a thing. <laughs> so. Some of these things is just, yeah, and it, for people who are not C developers, some of these things don't make sense. Same with like the Oracle API. People who know OCI 8, the underlying Oracle API, are perfectly comfortable with the way the PHP implementation works because it just mirrors what they already know. Someone who's switching from MySQL to Oracle and don't know anything about Oracle was like, wow, this is so inconsistent. It looks nothing like the MySQL API. It's like, no, that's true because the underlying library is nothing like the MySQL library underneath it. And that's kind of the thing that's consistent across all the PHP is that it's, it tends to be more vertically consistent than horizontally consistent. Okay, perfect. I have a, I, th there are a couple of, of questions around Etsy. Uh, I'll, I'll do the one for you, Leo, uh, and, for, and for you as well, Rachana. Uh, what is the PHP job opportunity in 2021 and maybe even in 2022? This is a question we get very often here on the, on the PHP Mexico community meetup. So, I mean, I, I would just like you guys, from your point of view, to you know, what are your thoughts on this? I can start, Leo. Can I? Like, my thinking is like, where is web going in 2021 and 2022? It's still very much there. And there is more and more adoption, you know, across the world. So as long as, you know, I saw a lot of comments also, like, can, if I know C Sharp, can I do PHP? I'm like, I, before I joined Etsy, I was a C Sharp uh, developer and I learned PHP at Etsy. So I feel like a lot of similar web languages are very much transferable. Having said that, we are hiring a lot of people with, um, you know, as we are language agnostic, which Leo just mentioned at Etsy, 
both with web development skills, mobile app development skills, we are hiding across leadership spectrum. So Leo can add to it. Yeah, absolutely. And we'll we'll share a QR code where you can get um, kind of some visibility into our career page and a hiring alias too, that you can feel free to reach out with any questions. But I think what's most important is that we're excited really for for Mexico and and you know the the, the tech community there and how it continues to, to boom. And we're just excited to be part of the long-term vision there as well. And we really see uh, Mexico just being such an incredible addition to to, to Etsy as far as a, a new location, but then also being our Latin American tech hub as well. So just excited about the, the work that's going to be done there uh, and really excited for anyone that, that really would be welcome to, to join as well. So feel free. There will be a QR code um, that will link to our careers page, but then also by any means, feel free to reach out to the to the hiring email um, address as well. I'm more than happy to reach out and, and have a discussion about opportunities or, or anything that might be related. Yeah. And it's again, it's really not so much about the tool. If you're passionate about Etsy and what we're trying to do and marketplaces in general, and the technology behind it, we don't care which language you're good at. It helps if you know one, because learning your first programming language is hard. Learning your second, third, fourth, and fifth is very, very easy. Okay, perfect. Um, here we have another question. Sagrario, would you mind? <laughs> what tools are you well, Alejandro Lopez asks us, uh, what tools are you using for CI CD at Etsy? Um, well, we've written our own, uh, a few of our own. We have like a deploy nader tool. We use Jenkins um, mostly is handling CI. Git is our source repository behind it. And then our deploy mechanism, we basically are sync things around and D shell and there's a but mostly we, we are sync into the, you know how I showed the AB um, doc roots, we basically are sync into the, the non-active doc root from that. So that's the, the continuous integration part is like we pull things directly from Git into, into our doc roots. Um, what other tools are we using? I mean, we have tons of Grafana and logging tools and stuff that I guess is part of CI and CD technically as well. Um, but we're not doing anything sort of revolutionary on that. It's pretty standard stack there. Okay. Um, we have a final question for you, Rasmus. It should be, I don't know how easy or how hard to answer is going to be. How many elephants do you currently own? <laughs> oh, <laughs> uh, behind my flag here, I probably have about, I don't know, 16 or so. I've gotten way more over the years. Yeah. Uh, but I tend to give them away. Um, so I've, I've given away probably at least as many, probably more than that. Uh, okay. But, but I, because people will often give me multiples of what, so I usually keep one <laughs> of each, right? And then I give away others too. To okay. Good. Good. Well, uh, Rasmus, um, <laughs> Leo, Rachana, everyone on Etsy, thank you very much for 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 this talk. You know, uh, we are going to close the 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 meetup. We have a couple of more announcers for the community but you know we have over 200 people online today it was great for hearing to you hearing to the etsy team uh sagrario also was awesome here uh, so i just want to you know thank okay. you for this opportunity to sh there was like a question someone asked like why would rasmus even consider giving the talk here on the php uh, mexico <laughs> community i'm sure he you know i'm sure he will say because you know he loves it and you know he <laughs> was just eager for it <laughs> no, I do. I mean, I, I do miss seeing people in person, though. I'm not a big fan of virtual talks, but this is as close as I can get to, to people right now. I really hope we can do this again next year um, in person somewhere. Yeah. I'll, I'll happily come to Mexico and, and give a talk there. We will put the pizzas on the beer and water for, you know, whomever. <laughs> Doesn't feel like pizza. Okay, and some Jamaica for me, please. Yeah, we'll do Jamaica. I'll do Jamaica beer for you, of course. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yeah, let, uh, let me let me add uh, the same as Mariano say. Thank you so much. I mean, that was awesome. Thank you, Rasmus, Rasmus, for sharing your knowledge with us, and and of course, thanks, Rachana and Leo, for your presence and as answer the questions. It has been an honor, definitely. Thank you. And thank you for arranging it. Honors all ours. Thank you so yeah. much. Thank you so Good much. Good night, folks. Good night. Yeah. Good night. No, if you want. 
what? <laughs> Can we go? No, I, I was about to say that if you want to continue with the annual Oh, me. <laughs> so, yeah. Okay, I'll continue. So, um, you know, oh, FYI, no? no. no? <laughs> I'm Where do you want me to go? Really exciting. Yeah, I, I thought that uh, Rasmus and Rochana Leo stayed with us. Really oh, this wanted annual. to say. Yeah. Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, I was about to say, so, anyway. Yeah, oh, we are a little bit late. Okay, apparently we can change to Spanish, right? <laughs> I mean, if you want to. <laughs> yeah, but no. Sí que. Um, vale. You can see the, the slides in English if you are here still and you, you don't speak Spanish. <laughs> sí, este, solo algunos anuncios. Eh, pues tenemos eh, nuestro podcast, El Cuarto del Elefante. Eh, queremos decirles que... Eh, hay seis episodios ya que se salieron a, al aire. Mañana va a estrenarse el episodio número siete. Y vamos a estar hablando de PHP MX Women y otras comunidades de tecnología. Este, eh, y pues visiten el link para que lo puedan escuchar en la plataforma que más les guste. Perfecto. Bueno, pues eh, tenemos ya muy pronto, en un par de semanas, esta charla con Dafne Díaz. Ella es parte de la comunidad de PHP México. Se llama Grit y tu poder interior. Grit se traduciría algo así como, como, como perseverancia, echarle ganas. No, no, yo no lo sé trans, este, traducir, pero es un término muy interesante. Entonces, pues bueno, no se pierdan esa charla en este mismo canal y más o menos casi esta misma hora, pero el 12 de octubre. Y, pues, bueno, como mencionó Leo hace un momento, eh, aquí está el QR de, de, de Etsy. Ellos tienen eh, posiciones abiertas. Eh, entonces, están buscando expertos en producto e en ingeniería ya aquí en México. Y, pues, para saber más acerca de esto, pueden visitar careers.etsy.com o pueden mandar su perfil, su perfil a través de México, guión, arroba, etsy.com. Y aquí está el QR para que lo visiten, como Leo mencionó. Sí, súper interesante. De hecho, estos links también están aquí en la descripción del, del video. Entonces, este, si sienten que el código QR está muy chiquito, muy borroso, o lo están viendo en su celular, pues bueno, simplemente los links también están aquí. Y bueno, pues nos pueden encontrar en todos estos lugares. Tenemos nuestra página de internet que es phpmexico.mx. Estamos en este canal de YouTube. Nuestra cuenta de Twitter, twitter.com diagonal php México. Eh, si quieren inscribirse a nuestro Slack, simplemente vayan a phpmx.slack.com. Como decía Sagrario, tenemos más de 1100 personas ahí. Eh, en meetup.com diagonal php de Rightway se enteran de todos los meetups, ahí los apuntamos. Tenemos una página de Facebook y un grupo de Facebook. Uno está como facebook.com diagonal php México y el otro es facebook.com diagonal groups diagonal php México. También tenemos un repositorio en GitHub, donde pueden colaborar para las herramientas que usamos en la comunidad, como nuestra página web, nuestro bot de Slack, eh, por si quieren practicar open source, ya viene octubre a partir de mañana, cualquier pull request que hagan y se haga merch, participa en el Hacktoberfest, entonces pues cáiganle. Además tenemos LinkedIn, lo encuentran como PHP México y Instagram PHP MX. Pues sí, creo que esto ha sido todo, amigos. Eh... Y realmente, pues, creo que solo quiero comentar que, pues, sí, esto va a quedar guardado en nuestro canal de YouTube. Y, pues, aparte de eso, creo que se nos va a guardar en nuestros corazones porque es la primera charla virtual que tenemos con Rasmus. Entonces, ahí está el video para quien no la vio en su momento y para quien la quiera repetir. Y eso. Pues, muchísimas gracias a todos. Y como se dice en PHP, este es el fin del archivo. Nos vemos en el próximo Meetup. Gracias. Descansen.